I'm Matt McLaughlin. This is Living History. A date which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was our final tower. Hello podcasters, what an exciting couple of days it's been. AE-1, Australia's first World War submarine, has been discovered. It's been missing for 103 years. A new expedition has gone out to try and track it down and within the first couple of days they've found it off the coast of New Guinea. So it's a really wonderful day for Australian military history. This is this is bringing an end to our greatest naval mystery and I'm really looking forward to seeing the more information come out in the coming days and weeks that are going to hopefully tell us exactly what happened to AE1 but a really wonderful day great for families of the 35 men who were lost when this ship was sunk in 1914 and today we're going to talk more about it we're going to talk to David Howell who is a historian who is an absolute expert on the whole New Guinea region from both the First and Second World Wars. Uh, He was formerly with the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne. And we're going to talk to David about this wonderful discovery, AE1, no longer missing, discovered on the seafloor. So let's hear from David. David, an exciting day yesterday. Uh, AE1 has been discovered. Indeed. Uh, I never thought that uh, I would actually even uh, see the day that this would happen. Uh, It was something that uh, has been in the making for, well, 103 years, but uh, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Amazing, for especially for the relatives of those uh, 35 um, officers and sailors who are now on the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful that we finally solved this mystery, Australia's most enduring maritime mystery. It's, it's, it's really great news for the Navy. It's great news for the families, as you say. Just as a starting point, why don't you tell us um, what is the background of this submarine? Why? I mean, I think lots of people would be amazed to know that Australia even had submarines during the First World War. This We're talking brand new technology. We're talking, you know, very new technology that we didn't really, you know, we're only just getting our heads around how to use it properly. I think uh, Australians would be very uh, intrigued to know that we even had submarines. So why don't you tell us a little bit about AE-1 and how Australia came to have submarines in the first place? Yeah, well, the Australian Navy uh, just before the First World War is quite uh, is quite new. You know, we were only uh, had our own proper Royal Australian Navy since 1911, so only three years before the First World War and three years before the submarine disappears. But um, it had some controversy in the sense that uh, our Prime Minister at the time, Alfred Deakin, uh, trying to uh, you know secure uh, money and, and funding and that to try and get the Navy off the ground. And here, here we are buying uh, two two submarines where. Uh, even Creswell himself, the father of the Royal Australian Navy, didn't didn't see the advantage for Australia having them. They were, as you say, uh, new technology and technology in its infancy. At uh, the no sonar, uh, you imagine the tight, cramped conditions on these vessels. And Australia <coughs> forges ahead and buys from Britain, or commissions rather, to have these two uh, submarine E-class submarines built. And um, you know they are part of the uh, the new Royal Australian Navy, uh, HMAS Australia, is our flagship, and uh, they're only uh, in service uh, for a short period of time before they're um, deployed on Australia's first operation of the Great War. So, tell us about what was it like for the men who served on these submarines? Because I, rem- I imagine it was a pretty Spartan existence. I imagine it was a pretty uncomfortable existence. What what was it like for the men on board a World War One submarine? Yeah, well, I was just uh, looking over my notes before there and, you know, they were talking, some of the men are talking about how everything inside the submarine had this taste, this taste of uh, oil and diesel. The smell would get into the food, it would get into the clothing, Um, you know, it was cramped conditions. For example, even the uh, officer's uh, wardroom uh, and quarters area had a, a bunk, one bunk that was shared between the captain and the next two officers down. So you can imagine uh, the toilet, or the heads as the naval chaps call it, uh, was consisted of a bucket. Um, you know, there's no real washing. Uh, you, you're literally inside this um, uh, this tin can, who, who, which would, uh, uh, you know, be 
I would just imagine unbelievable to, to try and work and do your job and to, and to sleep and to doing a watch two hours on, two hours off, so no real sleep and uh, not feeling clean and, and everything, having this foul, foul taste. And, of course, um, imagine what the oxygen. I mean, smoking, although everyone smoked in those days, smoking was banned on these uh, vessels for obvious reasons, but the air uh, became stale and it would have just been this claustrophobic um, uh, cesspool, if you will, of, uh, of, of, of you and your fellow crew, 35 crew, uh, in, in extraordinary conditions. It sounds absolutely horrific. And I mean, you say they didn't even have sonar. How were, they, how were these early submarines supposed to find the enemy and sink enemy ships? Well, a lot of a lot of it. It's my understanding that a lot of the uh, uh, of the of the of the way the submarine worked is that it was on the surface, and um, it, you know it would it would I guess it would be navigating uh, by taking the bearing off off a point that it could see. If it saw an enemy ship, it would then take a take a, a line, if you will, to attack on it and go towards it and dive, uh, firing its um, <clears throat> torpedo, and then. Uh, it would attack that way and then disappear, as opposed to what we think of uh, things like Hunt for the Red October and mo- more modern day, where the submarine under the surface hunting around for, for ships and things like that. It was very, very primitive uh, technology for submarines in its day. And when they did dive and they were under the surface, it really was uh, uh, a bit of chance, I guess. They had uh, bearings taken from a compass. They could, uh, you know, he- head towards a certain point and then they would have to surface and then get their bearings and continue on. That sounds like a really horrific way to fight a war. I mean, there were no aspects of the First World War that were particularly uh, enjoyable. It was, a, it was a horrific war all round. But serving on a submarine, especially with technology that was just so new, it, it sounds absolutely horrific. Um, but just moving forward from that, I mean, what, we, this, this submarine was lost uh, off the islands of Papua New Guinea. I mean, what was the submarine even doing up in that area in 1914? Yeah, so really quick uh, organisation on behalf of Australia in the sense that a war is declared uh, and Germany has a heap of territory uh, in, the, in the South Pacific. It also has a big uh, German fleet, um, which was commanded by a chap, Maximilian von Spray. It had uh, some powerful naval assets and more importantly, uh, the Germans were able to communicate uh, by wireless, uh, which is new technology in itself. Imagine instead of a a message taking, uh, you know, uh, you know, weeks to go from one side of the world to the other, uh, was now reduced to a matter of days. And uh, Britain asked Australia to look, to come up with a task force uh, to sail north and to remove uh, the threat that the Germans had in what was uh, German territory of Rabaul, which is now the capital of East New Britain. And it's the island above Papua New Guinea. So if um, listeners imagine Papua New Guinea, and if you keep going further north on the map, you'll find uh, the islands of New Britain and and, and New Ireland. Uh, Australia uh, got a task force together uh, within a month, and it consisted of um, about 1,000 soldiers and about 500 um, sailors to be used uh, as a boarding uh, parties and uh, and uh, landing parties, and uh, the ta- the combined task force was called the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force. And um, as I said, it only took a month to get it together. And uh, we we sail up to uh, to Rabaul, and we go in, and we uh, are very cautious about Germany having these big ships like the Schornhurst and the Nicena, and uh, and we're there to do a mission. It's a very easy date to remember, September 11th. That one day in September, where um, we we land at dawn, it's Australia's first dawn landing, its first amphibious landing, and we have a battle up the bit of Parker Road. Um, in, in during the fighting, it only goes for the day, but uh, we lose six six um, um, or five sailors and and one one soldier who's a medical officer. The Germans lose one one German, and um, they lose around about thirty uh, New Guinean troops. And um, but we successfully capture the wireless stations. It was a very successful operation uh, in that regard. Unfortunately, there was that loss of life, and um, only three days after uh, the operation, uh, Australian naval uh, vessels are patrolling, looking for these German um, 
ships, naval assets around it, and one of those uh, Australian vessels was the AE-1, and it goes off uh, on a patrol, and it never returns. And until yesterday, never knew where it, where it, what happened to it or where it, where it was. It's one of these chapters of our military history that we just don't know enough about, do we? I mean, this we talk about Gallipoli was our first operation, but Gallipoli didn't pl- take place for, for six months after this, and the, the fighting in Rabaul in the First World War is really a bit, of, a bit of a forgotten chapter. It's a cliche to say, oh, the forgotten chapter of the war, but I think in this case it's, uh, it's quite apt because Australians don't know about the fighting uh, in this area or uh, the operations that took place, or also the importance as well of of what was actually going on in New Guinea. I mean, the other thing I always think about this chapter is that the First World War we talk about as a European war, and we sent our troops over to Europe to really help out Britain in her hour of need. But this was all happening much closer to home, and it was pretty important that we, you know, that the Germans weren't um, marauding around on our doorstep. Well, that's right. If we were, uh, which we were, we were going to send troops, uh, in in um, you know troop carriers in all the way to the other side of the world, uh, you don't want to have uh, Germany having the ability to be able to sink those vessels. And you're right. Unfortunately, uh, uh, I guess for the members of the ANMEF that lost their lives, the carnage that would come at Gallipoli and the Western Front would obviously add a, overshadow uh, in terms of numbers the loss of life. But I would argue that it is very very important this operation. And I'll give you a little. Uh, um, insight into this. I have this wonderful photograph of uh, Japanese uh, naval officers reviewing Australian troops at Rabaul uh, during the First World War. And uh, for many listeners who probably know that Japan was our ally during the First World War. Japan batted well above its average uh, in, in doing what it was tasked to do, and that was keeping those sea lanes open with its naval uh, presence in the in the South Pacific during the First World War, and um, in in this photograph that I have, you actually have these naval officers that call in at port on on Rabaul, and um, they're inspecting Tropical Force, which was the uh, garrison force that we put in after the actions of the ANMEF, and uh, they remain there for the duration of the First World War. And and what I bring out of that uh, photograph is that had it not been for the ANMEF. Uh, taking the German wireless station and having their operations in Rabaul, it may very well be that Japan would have been uh, mandated that territory after the First World War. And and if listeners uh, fast forward in history for a moment to to 1942, this is the place that Japan had as its main base in that area of the Pacific where the battles for the Gorda Canal and the battles for the Kokoda Track were all launched from, Uh, the bombing on Port Moresby, all of that came out of Rabaul and... uh, and uh, it was probably through, in fact, I would definitely say it is through the actions of the members of the ANNEF that at the end of the First World War, when the Treaty of Versailles came about, that that territory was mandated to Australia. So a small action, but I would argue in the, in the, in the greater scheme of things, a very, very important one. Well, you're so right. The consequences would have been huge if by the time of the Second World War, this was Japanese territory. I mean, imagine how much they would have built up their forces in Rabaul if they'd spent 25 years building a naval base and building a presence in Rabaul. The the start of the Second World War would have gone very differently. So I I think you're absolutely right. What what an important yet relatively unknown action uh, in Australia. It's, It's wonderful that the discovery of AE1 is now is now making it bringing it front and center for Australians and now we can learn a little bit more about it yeah i think i think hopefully through this one of the things uh, in addition to now we have a, a known a grave if you like for those 35 uh, officers and sailors but if it bring does anything it'll bring back to the fore australia's involvement in our own region on our back door and the importance uh, that these guys played in securing um, the security for Australia, which I would argue not just for the Second World War, but has huge ramifications that continue to today. Talking more about AE1 itself, tell us a little bit more about the mission that it was on in September 1914, and how, how is it possible that a submarine would just go out and, and simply disappear off the face of the Earth for 103 years? Well, it is, it is still a mystery, although it's been found... Uh, it is still a mystery, and hopefully um, that you know some more light will be uh, shone on 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 this mystery of why it uh, sank and why it disappeared. But the AE one uh, at the time that it went away uh, disappeared. It was patrolling 
uh, just outside of Rabaul, uh, off a group of islands called the Duke of York Islands, which is very, very close to um, where the ANMEF land operations took place. And although the big uh, Von Spray's fleet had disappeared, it itself was worried about the Royal Australian Navy and, and getting caught. Uh, there were still other German vessels uh, in the area and uh, smaller ones, uh, lot, lots of uh, German uh, civilians and also some uh, reserve military personnel had not been rounded up. They'd still been uh, at large, if you will, and uh, there were uh, other smaller ships operating in the area. So the mission that A1 was on on the 14th of uh, September 1914 was one of patrolling, making sure that there weren't any uh, of these German vessels out there, or if they were, they could uh, take action to, to, to capture them. But uh, it's really strange in the sense that you imagine we spoke earlier about the technology of the uh, submarine, uh, you know, which includes communications. Uh, the, the, the AE-1 had a radio mast that they would uh, extend out of the conning tower, uh, but it was not operational at the time. Uh, so signalling or, or communication, if you will, actually happened by... Um, Either a megaphone, believe it or not, from 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 one Australian ship to to the submarine and vice versa, or by uh, by signalling with a with a light uh, in Morse code. So uh, basically, the AE one was sent on this on this mission to patrol. It was given strict orders to return by um, by dusk, by by evening, and at around about two thirty in the afternoon, uh, there was a signal had been received by uh, HMAS Parramatta, which was the other vessel that was patrolling with her, uh, to say that, look, uh, you know, visibility is poor and we're, we're continuing on and uh, Parramatta loses sight of the A1, doesn't uh, able to contact it again. It returns back to, to, to Rabaul and, um, and the A1, uh, in effect, goes missing uh, in the, in the post uh Days after after they've you know you imagine losing a whole submarine there is uh, reports of uh, of that perhaps that the submarine had become lost or that uh, uh, the, the maybe it gone and and uh, beached itself or it could the sailors could be on one of the islands there's also reports that that perhaps there was a German uh, sh- ship in the area that could have sunk the AE1 uh, other reports came back. That there was no oil slick, there was no debris, there was nothing on the surface of the water, and um, of course, the war is moving. The First World War is, is is getting underway, and it's not long before the entire Australian fleet returns from Rabaul, and um, the A1 um, is left behind. And although some reports and some uh, investigation goes on, uh, as I said, the uh, events of the First World War take over, and um, uh, A1 is. Is, um, is relegated to the history books. It must have been horrific for the families to farewell their young sons and send them off on this new technology, this submarine, and then just simply have them disappear off the face of the earth. And it's the thing that strikes me as the great tragedy of this is when you say a ship is lost for this length of time, it means that there's entire family members who lived or died with it, uh, lived and died without finding out what happened to their loved one. It must have just been a, an absolutely horrific loss for the families back in Australia. Yeah, and also you could imagine that um, very close to Australia, New Guinea and Rabaul, but a lot of Australians, especially if you're in, um, in, in, in Victoria where I am, um, you know, it's a mil- million miles away. And I also think about the families of, um, of uh, you know, the uh, British, the Royal Navy soldiers, or sailors rather, they, they were, uh, the day one had a compliment made up of, uh, of, of Australians, but also uh, British sailors who had uh, uh, volunteered for submarine service and you could imagine their their families back in um in england uh you know not, not even knowing where where new guinea or, or, or rabal is and uh without any information whatsoever and to and to live all this time or rather to live all that time after the after the war not knowing what happened or not even knowing where the submarine was it would absolutely be uh, just anguish that I wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't want to wish upon your worst enemy. You're absolutely right. Hopefully the discovery this week um, helps with the, the family members that are still around. Obviously the, the, the descendants that, that knew these men are long gone, but 
um, hopefully for the families, there's uh, there, there's some some comfort now in the discovery of the wreck. Let's talk about that discovery. I mean, there's been a lot of searches for this. This is this even though the the great mystery of of AE one uh, was was yet to be solved. We tr- we certainly tried hard, didn't we? There were a lot of searches for this over the years. We've been looking for a long time. Can you give us some background into exactly what searches had gone on, how we've used technology to try and find AE one, and now how we were finally successful in re- in discovering where she was? Yeah. So the uh, other than the initial searches uh, that happened uh, in the days after the AE one disappeared, we really have a huge period of time where not a lot goes on and uh, it all came down to a commander uh, in the Australian Navy, uh, a chap named John Foster. He was uh, stationed in Papua New Guinea in Port Moresby and uh, in the the, the mid-70s he talks the Navy into um, running a scan and he goes through a lot of the history uh, and a lot of the records and that to try and find at least some area where, where they could search and we're talking a huge huge area not just on the surface of the water but underneath and you can imagine that the whole area is very volcanic underneath the surface um, there is uh, lots of things that uh, appear over over time with the technology that it could be a, a wreckage but it, it turns out that it's either a rock formation or, or something else not only that but you have a lot of uh, you know ships and, and wrecks and that left over from the second world war up there and uh, so this uh, really starts in the, in the mid-70s and there were 13 uh, official searches conducted. The 13th one is the one that happened um, most recently, which ended up in the discovery of the AE-1. You even have uh, some really interesting things in the sense that uh, everybody, uh, I'm sure, would remember uh, Jacques Cousteau and the Calypso. Uh, you even have uh, Jacques Cousteau involved in, in trying to do a, do a search, even though that was weather and, and technology was against them at the time. And most recently for the centenary in, uh, in 2014, I was up there in, in Rabaul for the centenary commemorations and um, they sent HMAS Yarra up there to do a couple of scans. What I would say is though that some of this information that has been gathered over those years has helped in this discovery. Uh, and what I mean by that is that they actually were able to uh, rule out areas and search areas that hadn't, hadn't been found. Um, the AE1 Find AE1 Limited was the um, was a, was a project. Uh, it had great support from the Australian government, but it also had support from uh, private enterprise and uh, and also people. Unfortunately, um, the chat commander John Foster I spoke about passed away in 2011, so he never got to realise uh, you know their, their vision of finding AE1. But a lot of effort and energy has really gone in by. Uh, people picking up uh, the torch, if you will, to continue to search for to search for her. And um, I'm sure listeners would be familiar with um, the, the huge search that went for the flight MH370. Uh, that was uh, the same uh, vessel uh, that has found A1 now was used during that um, that search for that missing Malaysian Airlines flight. So. You've got state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, the estimations are that it's around about $1.7 million in the, in the making to, to, to find A1. Um, and you also have um, the past president of the Submarine Institute of Australia, um, Peter Briggs, and I saw yesterday on the news um, have him and his, his team that found A1 having this uh, small service uh, on, on the back of a vessel. Uh, the Australian government has said that they're not going to release the exact uh, location of where AE1 is to protect um, to protect the submarine. But uh, let's think about this: it's in 300 metres of water. It's quite small, as the way submarines go, and um, I think that it'll be well protected. And I think that um, that there'll be some exciting news to follow in terms of when we've found where AE1 is, but finding out exactly what happened to them. Well, that's the key question, isn't it? I know it's early days, but have you seen anything that indicates uh, what uh, the, the clues on the wreckage that may indicate what happened to AE One back in nineteen fourteen? No, I, I, and I think that really for the um, um, the submariner community, will will we'll be better at speculation than I am. But one thing we do know is that the submarine is intact, which is um, 
interesting because some of the reports uh, uh, over the years of what possibly could have happened is that one that uh, she hit a um, uh, you know a, a, a coral growth under the, under the surface and that uh, sunk her. Uh, she would have been broken up. Another report was that, as I said before, that a German, a small German ship who had a deck gun fired upon her. So, um, look, the basis of uh, the report that originally uh, came out when A1 went missing uh, has things in the report that detail uh, mechanical um, problems that A1 had been suffering at the time and uh, if the A1 had uh, died uh, and some of those problems had, um, uh, you know, interfered with it being able to resurface or, or to be able to be controlled under the surface, uh, you know, this A1 has uh, probably uh, not uh, been able to recover from that and, uh, and it's sunk. I mean, I don't want to speculate too much, but uh, it, it is good to, it's good to know that, that A1 is intact and hopefully, because it's intact, um, we'll be able to get some information as to as to what her final fate was. It's going to be very interesting as more investigations are carried out on the wreck to try and solve this mystery once and for all as to uh, what actually caused the AE one to sink. But um, I mean, I mean, I think we all hope that whatever happened, it was hopefully it was quick for the crew on board because the thought of being trapped in a submarine on the sea floor um, and knowing that you couldn't surface would just be such a horrific way for those poor men to go. Um, I mean, what does it mean now for the families looking for looking to today? The, the as we said, the, the the direct family members who knew these men are, are obviously long gone. But there's there's going to be people out there who who remember fondly the you know have a memory of a great uncle or a, a you know a great grandfather who served and was lost on AE one. What's this discovery going to mean for the families? Well, I think uh, I think it's going to mean a huge uh, uh, thing for families who continue that legacy. In fact, as, as we speak now I'm reminded of some of the news reports that came out uh, yesterday and one of them uh, was about one of the stokers on board AE1 which was a chap by the name of, of John Bray. Um, now here's a guy who uh, you know is only um, you know tw- tw- 23 at the time the AE1 sunk and uh, you know he uh, he, the, the family is still still living uh, in up in Ballarat in, in Victoria, and uh, you know they've they've got letters, they've got um, you know personal items that were that obviously weren't on the submarine that were returned to the family, and uh, you know there'd be family members, I would suspect, of not just um, Jack but of of all of the, of the crew that that would have this legacy where they may not have known the person uh, that, that was lost, but they would know somebody who did know, and. Um, and I think uh, that this would have dominated um, um, the, the folklore. It would have had uh, all this uh, mystery around uh, for, for two or three generations now. And I think to have some sort of closure for those families, it's worthwhile and it's, and it's uh, meaningful. And although it's come 103 years after the incident, I think that it's still uh, relevant today. I mean, imagine if you had um, you knew your great aunt, for example, and that great aunt was directly related to somebody who had disappeared and had no known grave. Um, you know, I've spoken over the years to many, many um, children, if you will, whose um, parents were lost or people who know of the legacy of the photo of the, um, of the, of the great uncle uh, in the sitting room who, who knows that uh, the heartache that would have been centred around these people that just disappear off the face of the earth, surrounded with all this mystery. So I think it is still very, very relevant today and I'm hoping that although uh, it's too late now for the immediate next of kin, a family as a whole will be able to put some closure to to what has been a century of, um, of heartache. Very well said. It's going to be some um, some ref- some wonderful news for, for family members who've been living with this great mystery for, for so many generations. Um, David, what happens to the wreck now? I've, I've read in reports that uh, the Australian government is going to seek to declare the site a war grave. Um, what happens now? How do we protect the wreck? Um, obviously, there'll be I doubt there'll be attempts made to raise the wreck from the bottom, but uh, but what will happen now uh, with the wreck of the AE1? Yeah, look, I think uh, I think what will happen is uh, the government's already announced that for at least for the time being they're keeping the location secret. I think they'll probably continue to do that. I think in its favour, 
is that it's a small vessel. Uh, it's probably not something that um, that uh, salvage hunters are necessarily going to go looking for. It'll be of little value. It's in very deep water, 300 metres, they say. Uh, so it'd be very, very hard. It'd be very expensive for little return. And it's also in a remote part, part of the world. So I think that all of those factors... Um, on one hand, has been one of the reasons why we have taken 103 years to find her, but uh, it's going to be another, one of the reasons why uh, I think that she'll be protected. And uh, and I think because that's there's, exactly... there's been problems in this area, hasn't there, with salvage hunters and World War II wrecks? I think the uh, the Prince of Wales, for example, has been fairly uh, comprehensively stripped by by salvage hunters um, just seeking the medal. I mean, this this has been a problem in this part of the world, hasn't it? It has, it has, and. Um, um, you know, I know uh, as recently as uh, I think last year, uh, there was a, I was in Rabaul and um, and uh, uh, someone from the, the US had, was quite wealthy, a, a private person, and come and um, and um, done some sort of a deal and removed a a, uh, a Mitsubishi Zero from the uh, bottom of the ocean and and and, and took it took it took it away. So. Uh, you know, it is a problem, um, but as I said before, I'm hoping that um, you know, keeping the it's been so hard to find the AE one and keeping the location secret, and, and given the nature of the um, of the size and the depth that the AE one is in, uh, that will do something to 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 protect it. I look, I'm always gobsmacked to hear these things where people are for for no other want of, of a small. I mean, how much salvage could you really get off off, off something like a submarine? But um, I think it, uh, you know, it does a great disservice uh, to the, to the memory of um, of people that gave their all, uh, and uh, we can't really give them much. But let's try and give them a, a, a place where they can have eternal rest, at least. Very well said, David, and, th- and thank you so much for your insights this morning into uh, what is a, a wonderful uh, day and a wonderful discovery that the wreck of the AE One finally finally found uh, in the waters off Papua New Guinea. So thank you for that uh, that unique insight into everything that's gone on with the history of this submarine. It's been really fascinating to talk to you about it today. Uh, and we'll definitely get you back on the podcast again in the future as more information is revealed about the AE-1. So, David, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, man. What a wonderful account from David Howell about the AE-1, Australia's first submarine, missing for 103 years and now found in the waters off New Guinea a really wonderful day yesterday when that news was announced and and hopefully this will bring some closure for the families who uh, who have been living with this great mystery for for such a long time I think um, I think David's right that there's there's low there, there's a very low risk of this being salvaged this wreck I'm sure it won't be I'm sure the wreck will be protected uh, it will be declared a war grave and it will be great that these sailors now have a known resting place and I'm also looking forward to more information coming out in the days and weeks that follow. Uh, hopefully shedding some light on the uh, on the fate of AE1 and how she ended up uh, being lost uh, more than 100 years ago. Thank you to everyone for tuning into the podcast this year. I've been really, uh, really gratified by the number of people that have reached out to say how much they're enjoying the podcast. Um, we've only done uh, five or six episodes, but it's been a fantastic start to what I hope uh, will be a a very uh, a long and ongoing uh, relationship with you on this podcast. So thank you for all your support. Um, this is our last podcast for a couple of weeks. We're going to take a break and come back in the new year. Um, but there's some absolutely fascinating things coming up on the podcast in 2018. So I, I hope you will uh, you will tune in uh, and tell your friends about it and review us on iTunes and, um, and tune in to hear some of those great accounts we've got coming up on history in the coming year. Um, I hope all of you have a wonderful Christmas and are looking forward to a safe and prosperous new year. I can't believe it's 2018 already, but uh, I'm looking forward to uh, exploring more military history with you in the coming year. So thank you very much. Have a Merry Christmas and we'll talk to you again.